welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Let's honor the Lord today. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord in prayer today. Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we just give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you, Father, for what you've already done today. God, as we approach your word, Lord, we pray that as we open it up, that you would open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we ask that you would come and speak to us, instruct us. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Show us great and mighty things to come, Lord. And we thank you, Father God, that you give us each and every one the vision and the direction that we need for our individual lives, God. And we give you the praise and the glory for it. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them. We don't think of ourselves as any better than them, but we would ask that you bless them as you bless us this day. And God, we give you thanks and praise. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can have a seat and get your Bibles. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews, the third chapter, and verse number 12 once again. You remember last week we started in a part one. Pastor Jim preached a great message called Departing from the Living God. Today, we're going to launch off of that same concept and that same thought. This is part two of Departing from the Living God. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter three, verse Number 12, we're going to kind of remind you of some things that we, we built on last week, some principles that we brought out of the Word and find out what really God was speaking to us, and then we'll take that understanding and we'll launch out from there. If you remember last week, Departing from the Living God, Part 1, Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 12, let's read it together. It says, Beware. In other words, you remember we are supposed to be aware of something. We are supposed to look out. We're supposed to be cautioned about something. Beware, brethren. Meaning this is talking to the church, this is talking to the brethren, the, the, the family of God. And so this is not talking to unbelievers, this is talking to you and I today. And he says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And that's where we get our title from, is in departing from the living God. And if I can just remind your, your thinking last week, we saw that it is possible for us to walk away and depart from God. You remember we learned how not to depart from the living God. There were four things that we learned last week that Pastor Jim brought out of the Word about how not to depart from the living God. If it is possible for us to do this, then we've got to pay attention, we've got to be aware, we've got to find out what it's going to take for us to not depart from the living God. You remember last week, number one was beware that you could fall. That we shouldn't consider once saved, always saved. It's, that's not what this is about. There are many warnings in the Bible telling us, he who endures to the end shall be saved, reminding us that there are some things that we got to look out for, we got to watch for, because there are some who will depart from the faith. And you remember we saw that numerous times in the Word of God. We've got to beware that we could fall. Second thing is that we've got to endure. Endure what? Well, we've got to endure with sound teaching. We can't stray away from the principles of God because they rub us the wrong way. No, when you feel that word of God rubbing you the wrong way, it's time for you to turn around. You see, God doesn't turn himself around. No, you've got to turn yourself around. God doesn't line up with you and I. No, we line up with him. And therefore, when we take a look at the word of God, we need to endure in that sound teaching, that sound doctrine. Because the Bible tells us there are those who would stray away from sound doctrines following after seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, that, that unsound teaching. And they're going to go gather to themselves teachers who will say whatever their itching ears want to hear. You remember that verse that we read in the book of Timothy. And, 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 and if you remember, we talked about how sometimes people will say things like, well, I, I don't like the way that that sounds. I don't like the way that that, that, that comes against me. You know, you're, you're telling me I, I need to live a holy life, but I don't want to live a holy life. I, I want to live however I want to live and still go to heaven. So they'll find a teacher who's preaching that doctrine, and they will gather to themselves those teachers so that they say whatever their itching ears want to hear, and they've departed from the living God. How not to depart from the living God. Number one was beware you could fall. Number two, endure sound teaching. Third thing we learned last week was fight. If we're going to stick with God, we've got to fight for it. And it's a fight, it's a good fight of faith. That we are to stay in there in faith and believe God, and we are to stick with God 
and fight the good fight of faith. And number four is conscience. Sometimes people get off and they're thinking about that and they say, conscience, well, I feel good about what I do. I feel good about my life. My conscience doesn't condemn me. Therefore, I'm okay with God. This is not about what we think. This is not about what you say or what I say. This is about what the Bible says, about what the word of God has to say. And therefore, it's not about our thinking or our conscience. No, this is about God's thinking and the God conscience. That when we can line up with the word of God and it approves of in the God conscience. Now we know that we're operating in the ways of God and we have not departed from the living God. Today we're going to launch out of this understanding and build on this concept because some have departed. And if we're not going to depart, then we need to understand some things and know why some people depart. Remember the warning that God gives us when he says beware, he's saying something about those who have departed because they have left the faith, they have left the living God, and now they've gone off to do their own thing. There was a reason why they departed. And and today, if we can understand that reason, then when those things start to take place in our life, we will know what's going on and we will know how to not stray and how to stick with God. Are you listening today? I said, are you listening today? Oh, good. I thought there was more than three people in here. (laughs) Today, we're going to take a look at reasons people depart. Reasons people depart. If we can understand these reasons, if we know what's going on, then when we start to see these reasons taking place in our life, then we will not depart. We'll stick with God. Reasons people depart, number one is unbelief. Unbelief. Not believing God. Many times people take a look at the Word of God and they say, I believe that, but I don't believe that. And it's almost like, you know, they they, they think that the Word of God is like the hometown buffet. You know, they they can go there, they can pick this part of it, put this on the place, I don't like that, so I'm not going to get any of that, I'll move on to this. And they pick and choose what they want out of the Word of God. And when you choose not to include the whole counsel of God, now you're operating in this thing called unbelief. I would submit to you today that it's either all true or it's not true at all. See, there are people who have gone through and they said, you know what, I'll believe in God, I'll believe in Jesus, I'll believe in... but I don't believe in the miracles. And, and, and they've taken all the miracles out of the Bible and they've, they've said, you know what, this is all true, but not the miracles. Listen, it's either all true or it's not true at all. And you and I have to come to a place where we determine in our hearts that if God said it, says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And we're going to operate in that. Why? Because when we operate in unbelief, when we say, hey, you know what? That doesn't line up with my experience. I prayed for someone and they didn't get healed. I believe God for finances and I'm still broke. Therefore, all that stuff in the Bible, you know, I just can't believe that any longer. It it, it turns into an unbelief and it turns into an evil heart and we stray away from God. John Wesley said, unbelief is the parent of all evil. Wow. Wow. That means that when we operate in unbelief, then the fruit of that unbelief in our life is now going to be evil things that take place. You say, well, wait a second, wait a second. Just because we say we don't believe something, that means now all of a sudden we're going to be operating in evil? Yes, absolutely, that's what I'm saying. Why? Because anything that is contrary to the will and the way of God, the Bible defines that as evil. And so we have to be very careful that we don't depart from the living God in our faith and in our thinking and in our belief systems. Why? Because when you do, now all of a sudden you're operating in a way that is contrary to the will and ways of God, and now you fall under that category of producing evil fruit in your life. Just like faith will produce good fruit in your life, unbelief will produce evil fruit in your life. We showed you in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 12. We just read the verse, but look at what it says again. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Notice that the result of having an evil heart of unbelief was that they departed from the living God. That was the fruit that unbelief produced in their life, was that they forsook God and they went their own way instead of going God's way. Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, you remember, and and they were talking about foods that went inside of a man. They said, you know, you can't eat that, you can't touch that, you can't do that, I'll make you unclean. And Jesus says, no, 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 you guys, you got it all wrong. It's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but rather it's what comes out of the man that defiles the man. For out of the heart comes fornications, adulteries, anger, wrath, uncleanness. See, whatever is in the heart, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is on the inside of you, if you have an evil heart of unbelief, then from that evil heart is going to produce the fruits of darkness rather than the fruit of of the Spirit. Are you listening today? Now, in every reason that we see that people depart, there's also a reason that people stay. 
So if we can understand why people departed, then we can contrast that and look at the opposite of that and see why people would stay with God. So then that means that if some depart because of an evil heart of unbelief, that would mean that we should stay because we have a good heart of faith. Let me say that again. Maybe you missed it. I, I should have got a bigger amen than that. But it says if some depart because of an evil heart of unbelief, then we should stay because of a good heart of faith. Now, there it is. There it is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. I thought it would be okay to use Hebrews 11 because we won't be getting there for, you know, probably a decade or so. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. For those of you that don't know what that means, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. So we just keep going. We've been in the, the book of Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 2, and starting chapter number 3 for about a year and a half, almost two years now. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, notice it says without faith. What does that mean? That means you don't have faith. You're not believing. Then you are in unbelief. So without faith, when you're in unbelief, it's impossible to please God. Capital H on the word him. Now, here's the reason why. It says, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. That he is what? Well, that he's God. That he's all that he says he is. That, that everything that he's spoken in his word is true. See, when we come to God, we have to reverence and respect God as such. So if we're going to operate in faith, we must come to him and we must believe that he is. But notice there's a little three-letter word right after that. A little word called and. In other words, when you see that little word called and, it means that what I just said is now connected to what I'm about to say means additionally, not only are we going to have to believe that God is, but there's also something else that you've got to believe about God. And. Well, what is the and? And that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. And we must believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You say, well, wait a second, Pastor. I'll, I'll believe in God. I'll believe that he created the heavens and the earth. I'll believe that he's out there, that he's doing his thing. But little old me here on the earth, I don't see a reward. Pocketbook's empty. Children have gone south. Boss is on my case. About to lose my job. Marriage is a mess. Neighborhood has gone down the toilet. What are you talking about, God's a rewarder? See, I, I, I may take that God is God, and I believe that he is, but I don't believe that he's involved in my life here on the earth. Now you're operating in unbelief, and it's displeasing to God. You say, but wait, I don't believe that prosperity gospel, Pastor. But wait a second, wait a second. I didn't write this. I'm not asking you to believe that. I'm just telling you what the Word says. The Bible says that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. That means that you're chasing after God, that you're not departing from God, but you're now drawing near to God. You're coming close to God. You're getting in His presence. You're getting in His face. And by nature of who God is and the abundance in the Spirit of God, when you get close to God, now all of a sudden you can't help but get blessed. People say, well, I tried that. I tried church. I tried praying. I tried reading and it didn't do nothing for me. Yeah, but that's just because you tried. Listen, a little dab will not do you, especially when it comes to the things of God. You've got to pursue and chase after and get in there and work it out. You've got to diligently seek him. That means it's not a one-time thing. This is not, you know, you put in your quarter and you pull the lever and out comes the blessings. No, you passionately pursue the things of God and you believe God at his word even when you don't see the results, even when it takes longer than you expected, even when it costs you more than you wanted to. But listen, I've got a promise from God and therefore I believe I receive it and it's coming my way. That's what this is about. An evil heart of unbelief will draw us away from God, but when we pursue God, and believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder, then we draw near to God. I love what Andrew Murray said. He said, the living God in heaven and the believing heart on earth, these are the two powers that meet and satisfy each other. Oh my, that means that when you and I connect with God, now something supernatural takes place. God's super on your natural makes a supernatural existence. Amen. Amen. Reasons people depart, number one, is unbelief. And we find out by contrast that the reason why we can stay is because we're in faith. 
Second thing, reasons people depart, we see this in the word, is trusting in self. Trusting in self. It, it, it's kind of funny, we just were talking about this in my Bible college class on Thursday night, and, and, and after we got done talking about our subject, one of, the, one of the guys raised his hand and asked me a question. He said, well, now, I, I just got a question about this because, you know, you're talking about operating the power of God, and, and, and people oftentimes will tell me, you know, don't, don't go out there and do that in your own strength. Don't, don't do it in your own strength, brother. Listen, don't do it in your own strength. What are they talking about? What are they talking about? They're talking about trusting in self rather than trusting in God. Sometimes people get all messed up on the will of God, a lot of controversy about the will of God. And in the book of James, it says, listen, don't say I'll go to this city and, and buy and sell and do such and such. Rather, what you should say is if the Lord wills, then we'll go to this city and do such and such. Really, the concept is, is don't go out there in your own strength, trusting in yourself to, to do your thing. This is about you and I getting a hold of the will of God, believing God, and then we go in the strength of God and we partner up with the Spirit of God and do everything we can to work out the will of God in our life. And, and, and in your natural diligence, God puts in his supernatural grace and gets the job done for you and I. Amen. Amen. Let me show it to you in the word in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 2. Turn there with me to the book of Jeremiah. Great verse in Jeremiah, chapter number 2. Jeremiah chapter number 2, we're going to take a look at verse number 13. God is speaking about his people Israel. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse number 13, it says this. It says, for my people have committed two evils. So there's two things we're going to take a look at. My people have committed two evils. Take a look at it with me. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And two, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. First time I read this verse, I kind of scratched my head, and I said, okay, well, two evils. One evil is that they have forsaken God. That's evil, my goodness. Second thing is that they hewed themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I said, okay, I get the first one, forsaken God, that's evil, but why is it evil to, to dig himself a cistern? Maybe you don't understand what a cistern is. It, it, it's a, a, a large boulder, large rock that, that was in the ground that they would bore an opening in and then they would hollow out the inside of that rock and then they would store water inside of there. That, that way they always would have a, a store of fresh water for them to drink or for them to use for their needs, for their purposes. And, and so these cisterns, they have them. You can go to Israel and, and they were just like these massive things, kind of like a well, but a well digs down to the, to the groundwater that's flowing. The, the cistern held water and it kept it there. And so I, I looked at that and I said, well, okay, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me. Forsaking God, that's evil. When you turn your back on God, that is really evil. But I don't understand, God. Why hewing cisterns? Why, why digging cisterns? I mean, they're broken cisterns. They can't hold any water. But why is that so bad? And the Spirit of God started ministering to me, started to bring out the understanding of what's really going on. There's a common thread in these two things that they've done, these two evils that they've done. Notice what the common thread is. It's water. There's a common thread in these two evils. Notice what it is. The common thread is water. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The key to this is that water was what they needed. They needed God, the fountain of living waters. Jesus there at the woman with the woman at the well in Samaria, right? Jacob's well. There they are having a conversation. And, and he says, if, if you should ask me for water. And I would give you living waters. He who comes and drinks of my water that I give will thirst no more. And she says, give me this water, right? And so we, we understand that God is the fountain of living waters. If they forsook God, now they no longer have a supply and they go in their own strength. And notice the words, hewn themselves. God doesn't want us going out in our own strength. God doesn't want us going out in our own power. Oh, I'm going to store it for myself. I don't need you, God. I forsake you, God, and now I'm going to have my own supply. And when we trust in ourselves, notice what it is. It's a broken cistern that can hold no water. You're going to end up dry Anyways, doesn't matter how much water you pour in there, it will always leak out. Why? Because you're trusting in yourself 
rather than trusting in God. In yourself is a limited supply. In God is an endless supply. And the Bible says, my God shall supply all of your needs according to your, his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we see that trusting in self is a reason why people depart. Now we can see the comparison, what happens when we depart from God and trust in man or ourselves versus staying with God and trusting in him. Later in the book of Jeremiah, it describes it even better. Jeremiah chapter 17, turn there with me. Jeremiah chapter number 17, some great verses, some blunt and in-your-face verses. Don't you love when the word of God just hits you like a ton of bricks sometimes? I mean, it's almost like a, somebody took a pail of ice water and just doused you with it and woke you up. Sometimes that's refreshing. Sometimes we like that. Sometimes we don't. Either way, you're going to get it today. Jeremiah chapter 17, <laughs> verse number 5. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man. Oh my, there it is. There's that bucket of cold water. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Anybody remember what we're talking about today? Departing from the living God. That person is cursed. Why? Verse number six, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see good when it comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. When we trust in ourselves, when we trust in our strength, or when we put our trust in someone else other than in God, sometimes people say, well, you know what? God is cool, but you know what? I really need a man, or I really need a woman to fulfill that void in my life, and if I could just get a hold of that, then, then, then I'll be okay. And they end up making the wrong decision, the wrong choice. They end up going after the things of the flesh rather than the things of God, and they find themselves with that broken cistern. They find themselves in that dry and parched place. Notice what it says. When good comes, they don't even recognize it. They don't even notice it. Why? Because they're in that dry and parched land. They're kind of like the mountains of San Bernardino around us. Most of the year, they're what color? Brown, right? And we look at them, and they're brown. Brown mountains. Mm, isn't that nice? Then there's like that week of rain, you know? And they turn green. And all of a sudden, the air is clean. The birds are chirping. The sun is shining. The mountains are green. We're all, wow, look how gorgeous it is. And then it heats up the next week, and it's gone again, and it's brown. <laughs> and all of a sudden, why do I got to live in brown, brown, brown? They don't even see good when it comes. They don't recognize it. They're in that dry and parched land. But by contrast, the people who trust in the Lord, let's take a look at it. In the next verse, verse number seven, look at what it says. Blessed, everybody say blessed. Yes. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Verse number eight, for he shall be like a tree planted by waters. See, it's all about waters. God is the fountain of living waters. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when he comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. That is a promise from God. When you trust in God, doesn't matter how long the recession is holding on, doesn't matter how long the kids stray away, doesn't matter how fierce the battle gets, how crazy your boss is, doesn't matter what the woman is doing or what the man is doing. Listen, the neighborhood can go to the toilet, but it doesn't matter. Why? Because my roots are in the river. Why? Because I've got an endless supply. I'm going to be like Isaac in the year of drought who sowed and reaped 100-fold. That's my king. That's my Jesus. That's the supply I have, and I don't care. Come hell or high water, I'm making it through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, a couple of things that we learned. Reasons today that we already saw that people depart. Number one is unbelief. Number two is trusting in self. Last one for today. You and I to take a look at in the word of God is disobedience. Last thing for us today, disobedience. Reason people depart from the living God. People fall, people fail, and they walk away from God in shame. The Bible tells us that we are to wholeheartedly adhere to the word of God, and we are to stay close to God. We are to come near to God and, and have a heart of faith, a full assurance of faith that we can draw near. We can come to his throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. God doesn't want us to disobey him and walk away from him. God wants us to stay close. God wants us to press in. God wants us to get as near as we can to him. 
You know, in the context of Hebrews chapter 3, it's talking about the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness and when God wanted them to go in and take the land and enter into the rest. And they didn't enter into the rest, the Bible says, because of disobedience. They had an unbelieving, evil heart, and, and they rebelled against God, and then because of that, they were turned away from the promised land, and they didn't inherit the promises. God wants us to enter into that rest. God has promises. He has a promised land for you and I. And he wants us to go and take the land and to obey his call. And as we do, as we diligently seek him, he will pour out those blessings on our life. We see it in the book of Numbers, chapter number 14. Turn there with me. Let's take a look at it together. In the book of Numbers, fourth book of the Bible, book of Numbers. We're going to go to chapter number 14 of Numbers. And while you're turning there, let me catch you up on what's going on in the story. The nation of Israel has, has come out of Egypt. God has shown himself strong. He's done miracles, signs, and wonders. Part of the Red Sea right before him wiped out the greatest army on the planet. Completely engulfs them in the waters. Now they've, they've traveled. They've gone through the wilderness. They've received the law. They've received the, the ceremonial system, the sacrificial system, the high priesthood, all that kind of stuff. And now God is calling them to go in and take the land. And they, and they get up to the border of the land. They get up to... They're at the Jordan River. They're about to cross over, and they decide they're going to send spies into the land to spy the land, see if it's a good land, see what's going on, see what's taking place. Joshua and Moses are there, and, and, and Moses commands the 12 leaders, 12 tribes, right? And you remember the story. The 12 spies go in. Joshua goes in with them. Another guy by the name of Caleb and, and 10 other leaders of the nation of Israel go in, and they spy out the land. The land is a good land. I mean, they, they come back with fruit, but not just in their hands. They had to carry it on a pole in between two guys because the clusters of grapes were so big and so heavy that they couldn't just carry it. They had to have two guys with a pole over their shoulder carrying in the grapes. And they come in and they say, man, the land is an exceedingly fruitful land. This is a great land. I mean, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. There, there, there's, there's houses we didn't build. There's vineyards we didn't plant. It is a beautiful land. But there's giants in the land. And they start to turn the hearts of the people. Remember, it all starts in the heart. And the ten spies start to complain, and they start to say, we can't do it. We can't take the land. We saw the descendants of Anak there. These are giants. They're looking over us. We'll be like grasshoppers in their sight. They're going to kill us. It would have been better for us to die by the hands of the Egyptians. We should have been slaves. At least then we would have been able to just live life. We should have died in the wilderness. It would have been better for us to die in the wilderness than to get slaughtered going into this land. Let's, let's get a leader and let's go back. And the glory of the Lord appears before the tent of meeting. And Moses goes before the Lord, falls down on his face. God says, Moses, I'm going to wipe this people out. They've complained against me. They've, they've tested me these ten times. And now I'm done. I'm going to wipe them out and make you a nation greater than they. Moses says, oh, Lord, Lord, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I'm paraphrasing now. And he says, but Lord, listen, you can't wipe these people out. The, the Egyptians are watching, Lord. And, and, and if you wipe them out, they're going to say it's because you weren't strong enough to bring them into the promised land. And God says, very well, at your word, because you've interceded for them, I, I'll, I'll not bring this calamity upon them. But you need to turn back by the way of the Red Sea into the wilderness. And for 40 years, one year for every day that they spied out the land, they're going to wander in the wilderness and their bodies will fall in the wilderness, and then I'll bring the next generation into the land that I promised them. So Moses goes back and reports the word of the Lord to the nation. This is the command of God. We are to go back by way of the Red Sea into the wilderness. And they say, oh, no, wait a second, wait a second. We can't go back in the wilderness. Listen, we'll go up now. Now we're going to do it. Now we're going to obey the voice of the Lord. We'll, we'll, let's go up. And, and, and this is where we pick up the story. Take a look at it with me there in Numbers chapter number 14. Numbers 14, starting in verse number 41, and we'll read through verse Number 43. Numbers 14, verse number 41. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Verse 42. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies. For the Lord is not among you. Verse 43. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because, here's the reason why, you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Now, I want you to get those words in your heart. I want you to notice something about that. Look at what it says. It says, because you have turned away from the Lord. So let's say this is where the Lord was at, and we're here. And he says, because you have turned away from the Lord. 
the Lord will not be with you. In the New Testament, we find out draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, right? Here we see because you have turned away from the Lord, he will not be with you. So that means to me, that means to you, that the proximity that we have to God is decided by us. Are you listening? How close or how far away you are from God is determined by you and I. We have a responsibility to draw near to God with a good heart of faith. And not to turn away from God and expect to win the victories in life. Why? Because when you turn away from the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. But if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. That's what the Bible says. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. When we stay with God, there's a blessing for our obedience. Last verse for today, Psalm chapter number 18. Psalm 18. You guys still okay? Praise God. Psalm 18. Great verses in the book of Psalm. Psalm 18, verse 20 through 22. Psalm 18, verse 20 through 22. By the way, I love hearing the sound of your pages turn. Thank you for bringing your Bibles. Psalm 18, verse 20 through 22 says, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Remember, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. Verse 21, For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not de wickedly departed from my God. Remember, we're talking about departing from the living God. Verse 22, for all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. What is God saying to us today? Reasons we saw why people depart from God. Number one, we saw unbelief. That evil heart that produces evil things in our life. And when that's birthed in our heart, we will depart from the living God. Second thing is trusting in self. That when we rely on our strength, when we rely on man, we're going to get let down. It's like a broken cistern that will leak the water out. And finally, disobedience. If we turn away from God, God will not be with us. But on the other side of that, we learned some other things as well. We learned that the three reasons why we can stay with God, number one is faith. We can believe God. We can come to God and believe that he is and that he will reward us because we diligently seek him. Second thing we learned is that we can trust God. That God is the fountain of living waters and whatever we have need of, we can go to him and he will supply it. Finally, we learned that we are to walk in obedience, and that as we draw near to God, he will draw near to us, and as we adhere to his word, then the promise of his word will come to pass in our lives. If you got something from God today, come on, give him a great big praise. Hallelujah. Let's talk. I want to make sure that everybody in this room, before you leave this place, is right with God. I want to make sure that if you died today, this was your last day on the earth, that if you died, you would go to heaven. Because we're not assured tomorrow. Listen, a very famous singer just died yesterday in a hotel room, 48 years old. We are not assured of tomorrow. And so I want to make sure before you leave this place that if this was your last day on the earth, that you would go to heaven and not end up in hell. You say, but pastor, here I am sitting in church today. Doesn't that make me a Christian? Absolutely not. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It's not about just sitting in a church playing the part, looking good. Okay, I, 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 here I am carrying my Bible. Therefore, I'm a Christian. Listen, you can't go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, wear the Dodger uniform, bring your bat and your ball, sit in the dugout and think that you're going to get to play in the game. Why? Because you're not a Dodger. They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out and lock you up. Therefore, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, but wait a second, Pastor. I've done a lot of good things in my life. and God lets good people into heaven. I used to be bad. I changed my behavior. Now I'm good and help people out. I'm nice to my neighbors, give money to charity. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get to go to heaven? Well, no, absolutely not. Show me in the Bible where it says you can be good enough to get to heaven. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And therefore, you can't make it just by being good. There's no grading scale on the back of the Bible behind the maps. It tells you this is how good you have to be. It doesn't work like that. I'm not going to make it to heaven just by being good. And I love you. I respect you, 
and I honor you enough today to tell you the truth and not play games. Come on, let's talk. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to get to go to heaven because, you know, I, I was raised in church. Parents took me to church, told me we were Christians, had me baptized or Christian as a child, took me to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck and had you, you know, in church all of your life. Raised in church. Born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Why? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that your parents raise you in church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere do you find in the Bible that you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, or be born in America, and that qualifies you for heaven. It doesn't work. You're not going to make it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I've been involved in church, Pastor. I'm going to go to heaven because I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible? Could, could you show me where a church involvement gets you into heaven? Not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, people think of you as a leader that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God's looking for your membership card when you enter the gates of heaven. Simply not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven. Some would say, well, okay, I, I understand that, but somebody told me that if I know God, I'm Christian, headed for heaven. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. Sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you. Old and New Testament. Wonderful. I'm, I'm so happy for you, but show that to me in the Bible, could you? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say knowing who God is, having some mental ascent towards God gets you into heaven. Why? Because the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. Having head knowledge about who Jesus is, or some mental ascent, and that gets you right with God. No, rather this is about your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? If not, then come on, let's talk. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do just that. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, but what does that mean? really means that you've given him all your heart and all of your life. And if you haven't done that, come on, listen up, listen, listen. Your eternal destiny is at stake. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, well, wait a second, wait a second. Time out. Why do I got to raise my hand? If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. You say, but I don't believe in hell. Isn't that convenient? Listen, the Bible talks about hell. Jesus spoke about it. Listen, just because you say you don't believe it doesn't make it any less true. And if God said it, I believe it. That settles it. Hell is a very real place. God forbid that anyone in this room should end up there. Today, you've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us in church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? What's lukewarm mean? Well, here's what it means. A little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, then you need to get right with God today. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, your call, your choice. I've done my job. God's already done his job, sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He died so that you and I could be forgiven of all of our sins, and he was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Today, it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. 
Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, don't leave this place unsure. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? Hold on one second, brother. We'll do it all together. Or my sister, I'm, I'm sorry. Hard to see in this light. Praise God. Who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart. Come on, get, right, get ready to get right with God. You know you're not going to be alone. All right? All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or wherever you're at, watching by the live stream, you can raise your hand, and then right afterwards we'll tell you what to do. But the initial part is just getting your hand up and saying yes to Jesus. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two, three. Thank you. Four, five, six. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Six wise people already. Seven up on top. Got you. Up there. Thank you. Eight. Thank you. God bless you. On this side. Up here. Anybody else real quick? Eight wise people already on this side. Anybody real quick? Real quick. Just pop them up. Pop them up. So what, everybody that needs to get saved is on this side? Come on. Where are you at? Wave it at me. Anybody else? Up on top. Thank you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. There's three more up there. How many was that? Eleven. All right. Praise God. Anybody else real quick? Eleven wise people. Where are you at? Number 12. You're sitting there wondering if you should. Come on. You should do this. You should do this. Anybody else real quick? We're pointing down here. Anybody else? Where are you at? Just, just give me a little wave. Where are you at? Up on top. All right, praise God. Gotcha, gotcha, number 12. We're at number 13. Number th- oh, there's two on top, 13. Up there, 14. Thank you, God bless you. Come on, anybody else? You need to give God all your heart. You need to give God all of your life. We'll wait for you one more moment, and then we gotta close it up. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for about 14 wise people. Hallelujah. All right, all 14 of you, or if you're number 15, number 16, number 17, number 18, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Come on, it's not too late for you. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle in a moment when we all stand and sing, and I want you to meet me up front. Now, no one leave during this time. That's rude, and I'm trying to get people to come forward. If you were walking that way, they're trying to come this way. We've got a problem. We've got a bottleneck. We're trying to get people here to give their hearts to Jesus, so don't leave during this time right now. This is ru- that's rude, Okay. If you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. I want you to stand in a moment, get your stuff, get in the aisle, get a friend if you need a friend. I want you to meet me up front. We're going to change destinies today. Even if you didn't raise your hand, come on, you can do that too. So let's all stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. You come. Won't you come just as you are. Hallelujah. This is your time. You can come too. Yes, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Praise God. You can come too. Come on, just get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Meet me up front. From the family rooms, you want to bring your kids. You can bring your kids. Come on. Come on. They're still coming. Let's get my hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Just get your stuff. Get in the aisle and you come. They're still coming. Come on. There's time for you. Come on. You just come right.